experience in China and India. The speaker that we have today is Datuk Sri Syed Zainal Abidin bin Syed Muhammad Tahir, a former employee of Petronas and now serving as the Managing Director of Proton Berhad. He was named Automotive Man of the Year by New Street Times Maybank Car of the Year 2008 and recently the Masterclass Bumi Putra CEO of the Year at the second Malaysia Business Leadership Award 2010. To moderate, we have Salim Gandor, a convener of Young Corporate Malaysia. Let's welcome Datuk Sri Syed Zainal Abidin to the stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, after the insightful advice on pregnancies and marriage, we will now move on to automotive. So I have here next to me Datu Sri Said Zainal, uh, who is the Group Managing Director of Proton. And uh, Datu Sri will take us through Proton's experience in China. I think there will be an emphasis on China and a brief uh, overlook on the strategy for India. So Datu Sri, without further ado, you may go to the podium. There's a clicker available for the presentation. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Salim and uh, members of Young Corporate Malaysian, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, uh, it gives me both great pleasure and honor to be here this afternoon and impressed to see there's still crowd on a Saturday afternoon, uh, close to Christmas. I think there are a lot better things that we all can do, but the fact that we all here focus and it's always very difficult to be the last speaker. To be honest with you, I was having second thoughts about coming this morning, this afternoon, particularly when I start opening the newspaper this morning. <laughs> There's too much been talk and I reckon, you know, I mean, apart from focusing the issue of automotive, maybe the question today might be distracted on what's been said in over the last couple of weeks. So for those of you who have questions for me afterwards, please do me a favor, do not ask because I'm not going to answer anything. <laughs> now, um, Proton China experience. Before I go to tell you a bit about what we had to go to, and I'm sure you've heard about many experiences in the past. Allow me to go to a little bit about history, and I think it's important, particularly young corporate Malaysians. Uh, and this goes in the company, almost every employee that we take, is to understand a little bit about the history about the company. I will not go into detail, but I believe it's very important, and as we go towards the next millennium, I think it's very important to understand what makes this company thrive over the last many, many years. In the context of Proton, what role do we have to play in developing the industry that we have been given the task over the last 26 years, and today we are 26 years old. Now, where's the... Okay. We were given three particular objectives to carry, and, uh, th and this responsibility were encrypted in the industrial master plan, and we are all measured every five to ten years in terms of how we contribute. And first of all, is of course to spearhead the automotive industrialization process, and that was way back in 1983 when the company was incorporated, then on the push of Dr. Mahade. And in 1985, when the first car was brought up, there was a big responsibility where we had to create an ecosystem. Obviously, I was not in the company then, but the people at that point in time had a very big responsibility to build up the base, the base of the real automotive industry here in Malaysia. At that point in time, not to say there's none, but there were basically assembly operation. But the government, that by Dr. Mahdi then, wanted to make sure that we build capacity. So it took about 10 years to build up the capacity of building a capability within the company. Now, when we passed that stage, was then go up to next scale, which is to upgrade the capability within the company. And that's why um, it happened in 1996 when it required the company Colotus. And that, from my understanding, was specifically to upgrade the capability within the company. Where are we today? After having acquired that capability, obviously now to harness and go global and to be internationally competitive. 
we don't want to be seen to be only a master here, you know, successful in Malaysia, but we have to go global. I mean, for many reasons. Part of it, obviously, by the push by the government to make sure that Malaysia remain competitive and to bring up the capacity of the company to the next level. This is how we play our role in IMP, and now we are in the Industrial Master Plan 3, having to update our capability, to enhance our value chains, to go global, and to now take the design and manufacturing of a car to the next level. And if you happen to have a chance to come to the factory, we have a very sophisticated design system, and people like the management, the board, go into the virtual starting room, and where we design and style our cars virtually. And that really cuts away a lot of processes and improve efficiency in the way we do things in the business. Now, how much have we contributed? Mm, let's see. Where should I point this? Oh, back there, is it? We have invested close to about 15 billion ringgit over the last 26 years. And I think this is very important for you to understand it's not a very light industry, it's a very capital intensive. And all of this, if you are the accountant, these are money that have to be carried in terms of our fixed costs. And obviously our job today is to make sure that the capacity is being utilized to the maximum, both in R&D, in manufacturing, in product development equipment and so on. I wouldn't go to the details, I'm sure you pass by Shah Alam or if you happen to be in Tanjung Malim, these are the investments that we made over the last 25 years. We have contributed more than 30 billion in tax payment. I'd just like to spend a few seconds here because there seems to be a lot of this perception to say that we're still subsidized. And the reality is not. We're not subsidized at all, and nor are we protected today. Other people within AFTA, people, cars coming from ASEAN, Indonesia, Thailand, do not pay import duty anymore. We still pay excise duty, and we still pay sales tax like anybody else. Obviously, the quantum of the money that we pay really depends on the car that we sell. Now, gone were the days, yes, many, many years ago we are protected where we didn't have to pay any import duty where people are imposed. But today, if you are in Thailand, just like we in Malaysia today, we go to Indonesia and sell our cars in Thailand, we don't pay duty anymore. So these are within the free trade agreement and we're not protected in any way. And you can just go to Google and look who are the companies in ASEAN. Everybody is ASEAN. Toyotas, Nissan, Honda, uh, the American GMs, everybody is already around the corridor. And when we talk about domestic market in Proton, the domestic market today is not Malaysia anymore, it's ASEAN. Because there's one free market already. Obviously, Thailand, Philippines and Vietnam will come to the table very soon, but we are already. So we are not protected. So I just like to sometime go away from this notion that we have subsidized and so on and so forth. So we're not. We are paying taxes and over the last many years we're paying about 30 billion ringgit into the economy. And that's our response. We still continue to pay taxes. How strong are we now? We have about 12,000 people within the ecosystem. You know, I mean both here in Malaysia and uh, overseas. We have about 1,200 people in Lotus Group of companies, a company that we own 100%, both in the UK, in Detroit, in, in in Atlanta, in China, and in Malaysia, and also hopefully soon in India, um, where we do cross exchange of programs, and we have people both in Lotus and Proton working at both places. I think this is part of growing and in, in, in maximizing synergies with the group, and the number is growing. And as you're aware, as you walk in this room, we have a booth. We do need people. I just also came back from UK the other day, about a week ago, and we spent with UKEC and how to try to attract the raw and the best talent of the country to come back and be part of this journey going forward because we are going to international and we are recruiting people for our China, India and Iran operations. This is our network in Malaysia. Um, when I started my job, we had about 400 outlets. We had to take the pain to cut about 160 of them and we're going to reduce this number from 236 to about 190 by perhaps by middle of next year. It's a painful journey. It's not going to be the most popular. I received a lot of negative comments from the people that had to go to this plastic surgery. But I think we need to prevail, and I think uh, the Proton brand must remain competitive. And we cannot afford to have what we call inefficient ecosystem, and the downstream people, the people that sell the car, people that perhaps sometimes have disappointed you, disappointed you in the past, 
really have to be competitive today. I mean, when you talk about 400, can you imagine one day, I, mean, I remember many years ago when you drive to a street, Proton, there are two Proton showroom about maybe 10 or 20 meters away. I mean, that is just not acceptable. So no or global OEM exists in that moment, but that's the kind of animal that we created in the past. So I had to take the pain to really cut down the system and the network. And today, Alhamdulillah, we are about sizable, but it's not enough. We just had the dealers conference about a week ago, and we want to cut it down to 190, and only the best will prevail, because the market and your particular customers today are much more competitive. Now, we are present in about 26 countries. We are exporting our CKD in two countries, and market under prospect, as you can see, almost similar to what uh, my good friend Shah Hakim uh, is going. We do exchange a lot of notes, me and Shah, occasionally. Obviously, he pinched my people every now and then. So, but that's contribution to back to a friend, which is okay. We have this common understanding among ourselves. But we are expanding, and, and very important today, we realize Malaysian market is going to be very small. I mean, we have about 28 million people, TIV about 650, even you command about 40% market share, you're only about 240. So it doesn't give you the scale. So if you do want to survive, and I'm sure Proton wants to survive, if you want to bring value to the shareholder, if you want big volume, you have to go outside. And these are the market, and not many people realize. So think for a while. Here we are sitting in our styling studio in Shah Alam, me, my management, and the board. We have to design cars that will appeal, that must appeal to people in 26 countries. And it's not so easy. And that is why we now advocate what we call market-driven. We send our people globally. Some people stay in those countries for six months. They sit, they leave, they work, they understand the market dynamics, and they come back to Shah Alam, bring back the character and the needs and the requirement of the market. And then we have to go back to the market and test it out. So it's not as simple as it was about many, many years ago. And that's what you have to shift. The entire progress, the system, the people in the company will have to align themselves to make sure that they are able to give and provide that delivery um, uh, in that sense. Uh, I'm a bit shiver when Dr. Raslan comes because he's the auditor of my company, so I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> it's okay, Dr. Just kidding. Now, I would like to play a game here. I, I find it very interesting. I had a bet with Salim. A lot of time when I had this quiz among universities, you know, out of the six questions, nobody get it right. I want to challenge young corporate Malaysians. How many of you are going to get at least one? Give me a break, you know, and it's Saturday, I've come a long way. Just get one answer right. That will make my day Saturday. If you don't, then I'm really disappointed with young corporate Malaysians. This is about understanding about what automotive industry means. I think a lot of people say, oh, senang lah, you know, easy, it's not complex. I hope with this six quest simple question, you now understand the complexity of the business, and perhaps when you understand the complexity, it now makes the challenge going abroad even more complicated and more challenging. Question number one. What is the cost of developing a car from a clean sheet of paper? Anyone? Corporate Malaysians, don't be, don't be shy. I usually have free gift, but today, Salim, you know, I mean, forgot to organize. Are there free gift? Are there? Are there? Come on, anyone? Five? Huh? 450 million. One more guess. 780 million. Look at it. 650 million ringgit. Now, What's the point? You have to make a 650 million ringgit decision when you finalize and freeze the styling of a car. And that cannot be wrong. A simple mistake. Hyundai, many, many years ago, when they came to India, they introduced a car. I wish Shah was here because we shared the same joke before. Develop a car and sent to India, and the car was rejected by the Indian public. And this is Hyundai. And they analyzed why. A car that was designed, I mean, nice car, I mean, it, is, it fits well in other parts of the market. When they analyzed, I mean, this is a real story. The car that was sent to India had normally, if you have seen in some of Proton cars too, uh, in the past, the automatic power window is in front and the manual power window is at the back. I mean, why? I mean, because 
the drivers in front, and we like to have automatic because you go and pay our toll, you know, the famous power window story. <laughs> yeah, people do laugh. <laughs> people still remember. Now, in India, the person that pays a car happened to be at the back. Hey, he doesn't want to use a manual, and the guy, he's paying salary, he's using the manual, and he gets irritated. They say, I'm not going to buy this car. And what Hyundai had to do is to reverse everything. And then, over time, that car is accepted. It's very simple. Small point that you perhaps have the tendency to overlook, but you make that one simple mistake, and we know regulator only costs about, what, 10 ringgit? And you have a rejection on the crowd. And that's a decision that we have to make every year in the company about selling cars to 26 countries. And Salim knows, he's been to many of those, and we debate, debate, and I will always ask, what does the customer want? I ask what does the customer in China wants, what does the customer in the Middle East want, and what does the customer And until the question has been resolved, we will not approve any design. That's a process. Second question, this is interesting. How, you are all of your driver car, I'm sure. How many components are in a car? Orang yang selalu komplain banyak lah, tell me. How many components are in a car for people who complain? Yes, sir. 400, brilliant. You must be young corporate Malaysians. <laughs> Anybody else? 40,000. Wow. 30,000 parts. Wow, we have two extreme here. Come on, last one. Huh? 3,000 components. Now, point again. We have to build 3,000 components regularly from a piece of paper from scratch. And we have to build it ourselves. And this is done by young Malaysians, which I'm very proud of. And they have to give them the task to make sure that it fits 3,000 components you imagine trying to put into a car and a car that you like to complain. Yeah, you know, Malaysian, they want a what? I always like to say this. They want a European styling. It's good. Japanese quality, which is even better, but at Malaysian prices. <laughs> You ask Carlos Ghosn, so dia pun garu kepala. That's a difficult part. And you have to do, make sure that 3,000 components happen to come into the right time and the right place to give you that output. And it's not very easy. How many engineers are required to develop a brand new car? Take your guess, someone. Huh? 150, anyone? 400. Anyone? 50. I think someone got it right. My congratulations, you got it right. You are the first person in, I think, this whole year that got this question right. Can you share your name, your resume? <laughs> now, that's the kind of resources that we do. So what does that mean? If you have 800 people, you can only develop two cars at the same time. And that's, people complain, why don't you buy a lot of money? You can Cari uang lah sikit. And cari duit 650 juta. Hyundai and Korea, Hot Toyota have about 15,000 people. We can go to that route, but it requires a lot of infrastructure. And it requires a lot of money and time. But we do have a different way to do it, and we work through strategic collaboration. That's the answer of rather than going to organic growth and go through you know, forming relationships. Now, how long does it take to develop a new model in a car? Anyone? Eight months. You have to tell me how to do it, man. <laughs> I'm impressed. Two years. Five, five, two. <laughs> five years. <laughs> you'll, be arc, you'll be old age by the time you finish. You know? <laughs> and somebody got it right. Two years. 24 months. Wow, this is getting better. Two out of four. 24 months of painstaking, diligently disciplined process that cannot go wrong. And I, you can ask the people in my company, even I do not decide what is the shape of the car. We have a process. The managing director of any company doesn't decide the color that I want because what? I'm already old age. How am I going to send to young corporate Malaysian in China or young corporate Indian in India? Their taste is different. But if I'm going to impose my likes, 
as the MD and say, I like this color, I want this design, I will make a 650 million mistake. And that's a consequence of what you have to do every day. And we are going through this process all the time in the company has been going, and, but now we need to put more discipline. Now, this is something that's going to be mind boggling to you. I mean, how many parts arrive in our plant in a single minute, an average? You think it's easy? How many parts in a single minute? Take a guess. Anyone? 20,000. Wow. 5,000. 300. Huh? Oh, are, you, are you a Bangladeshi? Always ask this kind of questions. <laughs> Very processed questions. Methodological in the approach. 4,375 parts in one minute. So when the line stop, when one vendor, I, I give you a very classic example, when people say, Adusri, why are you not getting the right quality? Tak pandai pandai ke ni? I will say this out before you ask me afterwards. I'll give you one classic example. I went to visit a particular vendor, a vendor that's about using metal parts. And this particular vendor, are given the task to do a welding of a process. You weld two pieces of the component together and pass to the factory, we take a look, we receive, we put in the car, the car goes off. One particular morning, when the parts came out to be bad, we sent a team and I went to do this post-mortem because it was such a critical part that we went there and we looked and understand why. And you know what happened? This particular vendor employs five 